morning. Good morning. I forgot to bring my. Is it on? Okay. Can y'all hear me? Okay. I forgot to bring my bulletin up here, so you can look in there for announcements. That's okay. Um, but uh, we're still doing the, the yard sale thing in the uh, youth room this week and next week. Next week will be the last week for it. So if you've got stuff to bring, go ahead and bring that. And you can be in there for next week. All right. Uh, anything else I need to announce? Are, are the kids having play practice today? Yes. Okay. After church. All right. Uh, prayer requests. Yes. Um, pray for Edwin. He's not doing well. Pray for him. Okay. Yes. Uh, the 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 tumor was benign, so it's not cancer. God answered that prayer. Um, any other requests? Yes. You pray for my phone and then okay. my family for you. Okay. Yeah. I'm not feeling well. Okay. Justin's not feeling well, so pray for him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together, to pray together as your people. Lord, we lift up the requests. Lord, we thank you for the answered prayers that you've answered, prayers of healing. We pray that you'd help people to continue to get better and recover. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for those who are sick, who need a healing touch, and those who are on our hearts. Father, uh, we just want to pray also you would help us this morning in the music and in the word to uplift Jesus so you draw people close to you. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, that uh, at least I believe, and I hope other members of this church believe, that our best days are still ahead of us. And that we just trust you for that. And, and we thank you for what you're going to do. Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing Hosanna today, and the chorus um, just repeats the words Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And so that comes from Matthew 21, um, verse 9. The crowd's going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you. 
up the stage monitors, please? Thank you. See 
to Proverbs chapter 4 this morning. Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to read the first 19 verses. Now, as I read this, some of you are going to say, now this sounds really familiar to what we've read in three chapters already. <laughs> but if, if, you're, if you pay real close attention, there's a certain person who is missing in chapter 4, and then somebody else who, who is brought into chapter 4. And so we, we get a little bit of a different perspective on the same wisdom that we've already been talking about. And uh, just, just to give you a hint about who shows up, uh, I, I've called this message Grandpa's Homeschool. So that, that, that'll tell you who, who, who shows up. But let's see if you can tell who, who's missing as we read this. It says, Hear, O sons, the instructions of a father, and give, it, give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, Let your heart Hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will guard you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. <laughs> Hear, my son, and accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded. And if you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil, and they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. The day of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. I pray that you would open it up to our hearts and minds. Lord, help me to apply it uh, appropriately to, for your people. And Lord, if there's one here today who does not know you, Lord, we pray that today your Holy Spirit would move and draw people close to you, that they might receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we'll give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when uh, COVID-19 hit, you know, a lot of parents got into the homeschool business uh, unwillingly. You know, they were kind of sort of thrown into it, screaming, shouting. And uh, it, you know, it didn't go so well for a lot of them. But you know, there, there is one subject in, in, in which that every household 
needs to homeschool. And, and I use homeschool in quotes because you know, it, it doesn't matter where your kids go to school. If you homeschool, send them to a private school, public school, whatever. There, there's one subject that they really need to learn at home. And that's wisdom. Right? Because what we're getting here in chapter 4 it is that, uh, you, well, let me just tell you, did you notice who was missing in Proverbs 3? There's been, I mean, Proverbs 4, there's been all throughout the first three chapters. The Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not, you know, we, we've seen all that. It, it, the Lord's not mentioned here in chapter 4, is He? It, it, it's the wisdom of Grandpa that's, that's, that's mentioned in chapter 4. And the point is, is Grandpa got wisdom from God. He passed it on to his son, and his son is passing it on to his grandchildren. He speaks to him there. And what you have in the first three chapters is we're looking at wisdom from above, from God's point of view. In chapter 4, we start to see it from below, from the human point of view. God is still very much God's wisdom. But the, the point is that, that, that it's making is that, you know, wisdom is very much a thing that needs to be handed off from one generation to the next. It, it, it's to be passed off. It, it's to be a tradition, if you will. Uh, and so I, I started to call it, you know, how I put on the listening guide, the main idea. I started to put this week, Grandpa's main idea. Because you see, Grandpa is brought in. In, in, in verse 3, you know, when I was the son to my father, tender and only son inside of my mother, then he taught me. In other words, this is what he's passing on is what his, his father taught him, is what he's passing on to his children. And, and so Grandpa's main idea, and the main idea of this text, or the main idea from God is that acquire wisdom and walk in his pathways. Whatever you have to do, acquire wisdom and walk in the pathway of wisdom. That, and if you were paying attention, the, the word acquire is repeated three times in the first nine verses. And, and one time is the word get, which means the same thing. So, so he's really stressing this idea that we need to acquire wisdom. And, and in the first three verses, I think the, what we can say for sure about that is that we need to make the passing on of wisdom a family tradition in our households. You know, uh, now... Marty and I have started a tradition in our household. This is not a wisdom tradition, by the way. You know, we, we eat like the, the traditional Christmas dinner type foods on Christmas Eve. But Christmas Day, we just want to hang out, spend time with each other, enjoy our Christmas presents. And so we go get Chinese takeout on Christmas Day. And that's sort of a tradition in our family. And, and, and you know... The thing about it is that's a tradition that if my kids don't pick up that tradition, it's not going to bother me very much, right? Because it's not something that, that is passing on wisdom, okay? What, what I'm talking about, a tradition is something uh, that previous generations are handing down to the, to the next generations. I, you know, it, it's interesting to, to think about this. Because he, he says there in verse 3, When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and he said to me. In other words, this is what my dad taught to me. He, notice he doesn't say, remember what grandpa said. In other words, in, in this passage at least, grandpa has done, gone on to be with the Lord. And he's passing on to his... And, and, and being dead, Grandpa is still speaking. You know, that's the kind of life of wisdom that you ought to live. Is that even when you're dead and gone, your wisdom is still around to pass on to your children. You see, the, the goal of Christian parenting is not just to raise godly kids. It's that your kids will raise godly kids. It's to raise children that will raise godly children. That's the goal of it. You know, so make it a tradition. You know, we, we, do, we have some traditions in our church that are good traditions that have actually been handed down by the Lord Himself. Baptism. 
That's a tradition. When somebody receives the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a tradition that speaks of the gospel. The Lord's Supper, that's another tradition. It's a, a sacrament handed down by the Lord Jesus that speaks of the gospel. What, what traditions do you have in your household that spread that, that hand down the gospel? That's the, the, tr the traditions that really matter. And notice that you know the, the father and the mother is what this is getting at. Not the professional teacher or the pastor or the government officials, as important as those people are. It's the, the, the parents have, have the most profound responsibility and opportunity to lead a, a, a wise tradition in the household. I was looking at some statistics. If, if, <clears throat> if, if you want a, an indicator of whether a whole family will come to Christ, if, if one of the little children gets saved first, is the first one in the family to get saved. There's about a three and a half percent that the rest chance that the rest of the family will get saved. About three and a half percent of the time, the rest of the family gets saved when a kid gets saved first. If the mother gets saved first, that ups it to about 17 percent of the time, the rest of the family gets saved. If the father gets saved first, 93 percent of the time rest of the family gets saved. Dads, you've got some responsibility. You've got some major responsibility. Moms do too. But, but dads, God has especially called you to lead your family. Now, now listen, what about us in the church? What if we don't have any children? What, what if we're already gone? I mean, what if our children are already gone and moved on? There, there are what I call spiritual orphans. Mom and dad don't come to church, but maybe you, the kid comes. We, get, you know, we have a responsibility to still be the voice of wisdom for those kids and those, that younger generation. That Just because you don't have children in your household right now, you, you can still fulfill this scripture. But, but listen, children need to see from parents that Jesus has not failed them. Can, can your children look at your life? Can your grandchildren look at your life and see that Jesus has not failed you? Not, not following rules, not, not all that stuff, but, but a, a, a strong personal relationship with Jesus. Can, can the next generation see that in you? That's what's really important. So we, we need to make it a family tradition, but we need to marry wisdom. In, in verses 4 through 9, he basically compares wisdom to a good marriage. And what does he say? What, is, what do we really need to do? We, we re, first thing you got to do is you got to make a commitment to be faithful to wisdom. He says, you know, in verse 4, let your heart hold fast to my words, keep my commandments and live. You, you got to hold on to it. You know, when you, when, you, when you say I do in a marriage, what are you promising? To be faithful. When you come to pursue wisdom, which if you remember through the first three chapters, we said that Jesus is, is the embodiment of wisdom. And so wisdom is not just a bunch of principles you learn. Wisdom is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you grow in wisdom as you grow in that relationship with the Lord. And if you want to acquire wisdom, you make a faith commitment to Jesus Christ. I mean, look at verse 7. This, this sounds kind of... This verse just sounds really strange, doesn't it? The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. <laughs> you, you go, well, duh. <laughs> you know? I think what he's done here is the, the writer of Proverbs, I think he's purposely messed up the syntax to prove his point. And, and what he's saying here is if you want to get wisdom, the first step is you got to determine that you're going to get wisdom. You got to make a determined step. You know, you got to. It, it's, you just got to say, "I'm going to get wisdom, no matter what it costs." In, in fact, in verse uh, the last part there, verse seven, and with all of your acquiring, get understanding. It's going to cost you a lot. It's going to cost you everything to get wisdom. 
And, and by that, remember we mean wisdom is a relationship with Jesus Christ. You say, well now wait a minute. I thought salvation was free. Salvation is free. You come to the foot of the cross and where you, you, you realize Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day. There is nothing you can do to earn salvation. It's a free gift. You take it. But it's costly. Because what you're committing to... You know, if you were in Sunday school this morning, you, you remember in, in Mark chapter 8, what did Jesus say? If anyone will follow Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. You see, it, it's, it's free admission, but when you get into God's kingdom... It costs you everything to follow Jesus. Yes. Yeah. And so you, you, you've got to make that commitment to be faithful to wisdom, be faithful to Jesus. And, and you know, this, you know, I, when I was a, a kid, I made this decision at Vacation Bible School, and, and you know, I, I came up and I prayed to receive Jesus and I filled out a card. But, you know, yeah, I don't, I haven't been to church since then. You know, I haven't really had much of a relationship with the Lord since then. You know, what, what you have there is intellectual belief. You don't have a saving relationship with Jesus. You know, James, in James 2.19, James said, you believe God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. <clears throat> in other words, if you just have an intellectual belief in Jesus Christ, congratulations, you've got the same faith that demons have. Faith in Jesus changes your life. Genuine faith. Jesus put it this way. In John 17, 3, He says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, the question is, what does He mean by know God and know Jesus? You know, here, here lately, all this hoopla about Taylor Swift going to the Kansas City Chiefs ball games and everything. And, uh, you know, she's getting made famous by some football player, you know. But, but, you know, you can read all this stuff about Taylor Swift, but would you say that you know Taylor Swift? You can know about her. You can know a lot about her, right? You can just get online and search all kinds of things. But that's not the same as knowing somebody. Now, you know, uh, you can even follow people on social media that are famous. And they, you can see all their posts and stuff. You can know all kinds of things about that person. But would you say that you actually know that person? And I'm not talking about stalking people. Don't be stalking people. Would you, would you know them? But if we're looking at this wisdom thing, like, like you said here, as being like a good marriage... Do, do I know my wife? Yeah. In, in fact, she sent me after uh, some tea a little while back. Some decaf tea. She was going to make some tea. And, and she told me to get, uh, in the text message, she said, get some Lipton tea. And I texted back, no, you always get Louisiana. She was like, oh, yeah, you're right. See, I know her better than she knows her. You know, it, it, it's that type of relationship is what eternal life is. It's knowing God in that close personal relationship. There's a back and forth between you and Jesus. That's what Jesus means by an eternal life. You're, you're growing in your relationship with Him. Now, this passage lists all kinds of benefits, and we've gone through all those benefits in the first three chapters. I'm not going to hit those again, but just, just to point out this, though. Is, is that the difference between wisdom and folly is that wisdom is life and folly is death. Receiving Jesus is life. Rejecting Jesus is death. But not only that, we see that receiving Jesus is a good life. It's not just life, it's a good life. It's a life worth living. 
And, and that's what we would point out about here. But then, okay, so we've got how to acquire wisdom, but now how do we walk in wisdom's pathways? In verses 10 through 19, the word way or path is repeated over and over again. But I want to point out here that there's only two pathways. The, the way of wisdom is mentioned in verse 11. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. And then there's the, the way of the wicked. Mentioned in verse 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not even proceed in the way of evil men. There's only two choices. I like to go into a restaurant where they have those, uh, what do they call them, Coke freestyle machines, the, the fountain, you know what I'm talking about? You can, you can pick your, your drink and then you can pick to add a flavor to it if you want to. And if you get that, let me suggest that you put peach flavor. It's bright. It's really good. <laughs> All right? Just try that next time you get one of those machines. But we, we want to approach our Christianity that same way, don't we? Yeah. We, we want options. We, you know, but there's only two. We, 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 we know that there's this rotten life of foolishness and wickedness if we reject Jesus and we become evil people, and we know that there's this good life of wisdom, but we think that's just for like super duper disciples who have decided that you know they want to be the super duper Christians in this way of wisdom, and we think that maybe there's this half decent path of mediocrity that gives us an okay life, folks. That path does not exist. It's follow Jesus or follow wickedness. It's, it's the only two options you have in life. So there's only two pathways. And, and the question is, which pathway are you on? And if we're talking about generational wisdom and, and, and you know, grandpa's homeschool, which path do your kids and your grandkids see you on? You're, you're on one or the other. Let's look here at the path of the wicked real quick. See that it leads to enslavement. In verses 14 through 17, he says, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it, do not pass by it, turn away from it, and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil. And they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. You know, now you may not be a violent person. You may not do all that stuff. But, but here's the point. Is that you're enslaved by sin. Jesus said in Mark 8.34, uh, John, sorry, John 8.34, that truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. You, you see, you, you don't have to be enslaved to the particular sin mentioned in chapter 4 here to be a slave of sin. I mean, you know, m months ago, maybe a year ago or so, when I, when I caught somebody in the act of stealing the catalytic converter off of our church man, that, that dude had worked up a sweat. He was, he was working hard that's not working. You know what I mean? He, he somehow had come, become enslaved to sin and thought that the easy life is stealing. And all, you know, but it doesn't have to be that. What are you know? What are you addicted to? That, that you know, it doesn't have to be drugs. But what is it that you just can't live without? You're, you, you become enslaved to it. But it, but it leads to stumbling in the darkness. In verse 19. The, the way of, wick, of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. They, they, can't see, they can't really see what they're doing. They may know what they're doing is wrong, but they don't really see where the path is leading. You know what I mean? you ever tried to get ready for work or school or church in the dark? I've done that before, trying not to wake Marty up. 
get to work one day, two different types of shoes on. You ever do that? Maybe get to work and your shirt's on inside out. You ever do something like that? Because you got ready in the dark. You could see what you were doing. That's what the path of wickedness is like. You, you know, you got this idea that you're getting ready for work, but you don't really see what you're doing. You got this idea that you're living life, but it is, it's not going to turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. It, it, it's, it's a path of darkness that eventually leads to being cast out into outer darkness. Three times in the book of Matthew, Jesus refers to hell as outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It, it's a path of darkness that leads to ultimate darkness. You know, we're, as we, we're going to look at this path of wisdom in just a minute. It compares the, the path of wisdom to like a sunrise. And we'll get there in a minute. But if you take a look at the path of darkness, it's kind of like a sunset. You, you start out thinking everything's going hunky-dory. Everything's all bright around me. But as you, you get down that path, this, the sun starts setting. And, and it begins to get darker and darker until ultimately the darkness consumes you. And that's the life of rejecting Jesus. But let's look at the path of wisdom. It, it, it leads to freedom from the dangers of sin. It, in verses 11 through 13, it says, I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded. And if you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. In other words, you not only can see where you're going, you, you can see well enough, you can take off running. The, the path before you is clear because you have the wisdom of God directing your paths. You, you know which way to go. So Grandpa saying to us, or Grandma, either one, follow Jesus. And the path will be lit up which way to go. You, you can be free from enslavement to sin. Look, look, you know, the path of darkness is enslavement. The path of life is freedom. I like what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 where he says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins and that we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. And when we formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, you know, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath. In other words, we were sinning and we were sinning because it was our fallen human nature to sin and we couldn't do otherwise. And, and then he says, but God, being rich in His mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus sets you free from that enslavement. When He sets you free, man, you can take off and run in that freedom. And, and folks, here's, here's the best part. I, I love verse 18. The path of wisdom leads from sanctification to glorification. He says there, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. What's he talking about? You see, when you, when you first receive Jesus and your sins are forgiven, we, we call that justification. And, and, and what that means is you stand justified before God as though you have never sinned at all. Your, your, your sins have been wiped clean, past, present, and future sins. They're all wiped out. You, you stand justified before God. That's called justification. Ultimately, one day, there will be glorification. When, when, we, when our salvation is complete and we stand 
in heaven or in, in the new heaven and new earth in a glorified body that is that will be sinless. It'll be completely transformed, and we'll, we we will enjoy the delights of heaven through all eternity. That's that's glorification. Well, there's something in between justification and glorification. It's called sanctification. And sanctification is what it's talking about in verse 18. That, that it's like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. In other words, you start out with justification, but, but, but Jesus at that point is like a, a, a little glimmer of sunlight, you know, starting to come over the horizon. And, and as you grow closer to Jesus, that it's, it's like the sun is coming up and, and the sky is starting to get brighter and, and brighter. And, and you get closer to Jesus and you're getting closer to glorification. When, when one day the sun will be completely risen and you'll be standing before God in the beauty and the light of Jesus Christ. Folks, it, 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 it's, that, that's a wonderful picture. You, you start out being justified and you walk with Jesus in wisdom and you're glorified eventually. Ephesians 1 6 captures it. For I, he says, For I have conceived of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You can't stop the sunlight from coming, the sun from coming up, can you? Well, if you are in Christ, you can't stop the process from justification to glorification. Jesus is going to change you. And if he's not changing you, you see, here's, here's the thing. You can tell which path you're on by is Jesus getting brighter or is he getting dimmer in your life? Or are you on the path of progressing in light, progressing in that relationship with Jesus? Or are you starting to progress in darkness? Are you walking away from Jesus? That's how you know which path you're on. Proverbs is saying, and you may not think of yourself as much of a Christian right now. If you're committed to Jesus, the, the sanctification, glorification process is like the dawning of the day. It can't be stopped. One day, praise God, we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord because of our relationship with Jesus. It, 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 that's all it is. And if we're, if we're going to bring this back to the to Grandpa's homeschool idea that, that we're in, in Grandpa's wisdom. Do your kids, do your grandkids, do they see a vibrant relationship with Jesus in you? Or do they just see a bunch of rules they're supposed to follow? You know, it, it's one thing to teach your kids don't lie. But it's another thing to teach them. We, we don't lie because Jesus is the truth and the life. And we follow Jesus. And we want to be like Jesus. See, there, there's gospel to, to one and there's this moral, therapeutic, moral deism, if you want to call it that, in the other. We, will, you, will you still be speaking to your kids and your grandkids when you're gone? You see, that, that's the kind of life of wisdom that we want to live. But here's the thing. Maybe you're, maybe it's going to have to start with you. Maybe you don't have all of that in your family up to now. Well, that's the good news is that you can start that right now with Jesus. You, you can't do anything about what's already gone by. All you can do is say, Jesus, here I am, just the way I am. I surrender my life to you. Would you change me? And he will.
Thank you.